Hello, good evening, everyone. Good to see you back, Luke. Sorry about missing class yesterday. No problem. I was, I was away from home. I was at the State Science Olympia tournament, so. I see. How was the Science Olympia? We got first. Wow. <laughs> first really? time. So I get to go to nationals, which is really great because this is my first time ever going. So wow. Really wow. Happy. My school participated in the, the New Jersey Science Olympia for many years. We, we even never get into the top 10. Maybe the closest around the 10th place. There, there are always you know, a few super strong teams ahead of us. Okay, great. Uh, nice to uh, see you all again. Uh, I'm not sure how many uh, will be here today. I know it, the day before, uh, no, not the day before yesterday. Yesterday is a pretty busy day, right? Uh, the UCT, Washington University, chemistry tournaments. I know some of you, you know, participated. Yeah, like Luke uh, was in the Science Olympia. Uh, congratulations. Uh, so before we start the class, I uh, just want to emphasize one more thing. So this class is fast paced and actually we have a lot of homework to do, right? Uh, not probably not much, you know, pre-reading, but a lot of homework. For example, the packet, we pretty much finished last time. When I say pretty much, you know, I do not have the time to go over every single question with you. So this is your job to finish, you know, those questions. <clears throat> and if you have problem, find the annotations and talk with me either by email or in Discord server. You, you, you need to do this. I know everyone is quite busy, right? You are doing you know, not only Chemistry Olympia, uh, but probably a lot of other stuff, school work, right? Sports, and maybe a lot of others. But guys, this is the most important three weeks. If you can, try your best to squeeze more time to put on the last three weeks. It, it will be you know, worth it. And if we do not spend this time in the most important time, no matter you know, how our class are, you know, how great this class is, but practice is practice. Practice cannot replace you know, the, your, your my class cannot replace your practice. So I, I want to emphasize this again. This is very, very important. We do not have that much class time to you know, really work on the questions, right? We already worked on a lot of examples, extensions, right? But that's not enough. That's not enough. So uh, I have a proposal for you guys to consider. Uh, I want you to uh, get your opinion. So I would like to, you know, to be honest, I'm also pretty busy. So right now, you know, we have three classes a week, especially the one on Wednesday. So it's after a, a whole school day, right? And teaching for another 90 minutes, to be honest, is, is pretty tiring. But, you know, still, I, I want to better support each of you. So I would like to, you know, uh, schedule a kind of one versus one private discussion with each of you, if you like. This is totally free but only for this group only, okay? Uh, so it will be, uh, I will you know, show you a sign up sheet for you guys to choose the time, but it will be pretty much in the same class time, 7.30 to eight o'clock. So for each one uh, by default, we'll have a 30 minutes in you know, the time slot for us to have some you know, more specific discussion. For example, if you think, hmm, in the in the syllabus, uh, we do not plan to discuss a certain part, but you feel I need I want to improve that part, we can discuss that. Or you, you want to ask me about you know how to you know uh, utilize your time in the most efficient way, in the best way. You can we can do that. Or you have any other question about the national exam, the chemistry olympia, or even your parents have any question, you know, they are you know welcome to join the, the, the session. Okay, I'm happy to answer any questions they may have. So this might be happening in this week and the following week because we do not want to put everything in the last week and then time is not enough for you to make any change, right? Uh, do you think you, you need this? I like that. I think it'd be helpful for me. Okay, okay, great. Uh, let's do this. Uh, I will share with you a sign up ship uh, most likely tomorrow, okay? And then, uh, or we will you know, have some further discussion. Okay, great. Last time we pretty much finished this packet. Uh, as you may see, I have another supplementary packet, packet about uh, many titrations, right? 
two important methods. One is the iodometry, right? Another one is the permanganate-based method. So as I mentioned last time, I would like, I would like to leave that for you to do more self-study. Uh, I will try my best to share with you an annotation. So basically I will kind of fill the blanks and then you guys can check. And then if, after that, if you still have a question, you can let me know. And then hopefully we can find some time to have some further discussion, but definitely it will be very brief. We do not have that much time uh, in class. Our schedule is very tight. And there are two other packets, right? Uh, the other two are all about coordination chemistry. The first one is about the basic concept and the isomerism. The second one is more like the bonding series, right? The hybridization, the CFT, the crystal field theory, right? So I feel that too should be in the level of the local, but partially extended to, to national. So if you think you need to fully improve in coordination chemistry, try that one. And similarly, we'll use the same strategy, annotation for you to check and then find some class time to have some very brief discussion. Okay, cool. Uh, based on our plan, we'll move forward to organic chemistry. Uh, you all saw the lecture note, right? Okay, cool. Hey, wait a second. Okay, it's coming. So, so this is our first class for organic chemistry. So we do not want to, you know, talk too much advanced. So this is basically a summary of some fundamental organic chemistry, but we definitely will do some extension. So the first part is about isomer counting. This is typically a hard question because if you miss one, <laughs> no matter you know how many you got, you got nothing, right? So this is the, the, the risk. So uh, the concept I want to introduce first is the DBE. I believe you all know about this, but this is a very, very important concept, double bond equivalent. So there are several different names. For example, it's called HDI. It's called hydrogen deficiency index. Basically means how many hydrogens are missing. Or it's called degree of unsaturation. Uh, so typically this concept will not be directly appeared in the exam, but this is the method you should use because we, if you see a molecular formula, the first thing, the most important thing, everything before you start, the first thing before you start is the calculation of DBE, the double bond equivalence. This means how many moles or molecules of hydrogens needed to add to a molecule to convert all pi bonds into single bonds and all rings into acyclic structure. You probably know there are a few small rings which are relatively unstable, right? Because of the ring string. Can you give me two examples? Cyclopropane and cyclobutane. Cyclopropane and cyclobutane, right? The reason why they are unstable is something called the ring string. It's because the angle here is supposed to be is 60 degree, right? Not degree Celsius, it's degree. But the ideal angle for a sp3 hybridized carbon is supposed to be 109.5. So there is a relatively large you know, difference, right? The angle need to be this much, but now we can only be this small. So the angle want to expand. So this is why the ring is very easy to open. So these two cycloalkanes are relatively easy to open by adding hydrogen gas. So you will see the first one will change into the regular propane. The second one will change into the regular butane. So back to the DPE, basically we are counting how many pi bonds and how many rings are in the structure, right? Why would you do this? One DPE equals to one pi bond or one ring, right? one pi bond or one ring. So that means a single alkene has a DBE of one. How about a single alkyne? Two. Two, right? Two. Koniki, are you there? Okay, I will mute him. <clears throat> okay, so now we can extend it a little bit. If we have a formula like this, CMHN, and let's say N 
um, how about we do it this way? C A H B N C O D X E. X is a halogen, right? I think this pretty much include all of the possible elements in the regular organic compound, right? Uh, first, we do not care about the number of oxygen. The number of oxygen does not affect the DBE because the oxygen has two different binding ways. The first way is to insert into a CH bond or a CC bond. For example, like this, you see the oxygen is insert in between C and H, right? Which means it does not affect your DBE. A second way is insert in between a CC bond, does not affect, right? But you may ask, how about the carbon bind with oxygen through a double bond? This one, the, we also do not care about the number of oxygen because once there is a double bonded oxygen, the number of hydrogens will decrease by two. So the DBE can be reflected by the number of hydrogens. So we do not really care about how many oxygens are in the formula, right? So when you calculate DBE, you can skip the number of oxygen. At X, the halogens are easy to take care, right? Because halogens are just a substitute of hydrogen. So you can change this formula into CAHB plus E. Am I right? So you reverse the halogen back to the hydrogen. Nitrogen is a little bit different. Uh, there are different ways to take care of the nitrogen. The way I use is I think nitrogen equals to one CH. Does this make sense to you? Nitrogen typically makes three bonds, right? So we think it's a CH bond. And then you can further change this into CA plus C, right? And then hydrogen B plus E plus C. So you got you know, a formula like this, which is just like a hydrocarbon. And then you calculate the DBE. The DBE this time can be the number of carbons times two plus two, right? Minus the number of hydrogens and then divided by two. Let me make it a little bit clear. So here will be A plus C times two plus two minus B plus E plus C divided by two. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah, let me know if you have any question, okay? So now let's have a practice. So now let's say I have a C3H7N1. I'm not sure. So if we want to figure out how many isomers that this formula have, you probably first need to figure out whether there's any double bond in the structure, right? So let's convert this into C4H8. Make sense, right? One N is a CH. Okay, so I want to start to revise it. So how about we change this into nine hydrogens? So this will be C4H10. That means the DBE is C4H10, the DB is zero, right? Is zero, which means all of the bonds are saturated. And then you further consider how can I, you know, put the structures in the different categories. So obviously, if there's no double bond, there's a nitrogen, this structure must be a amine, right? You guys know what is amine, right? Amine means one, two, three hydrogens in the ammonia structure are replaced by an R group. So there are three different categories of amine. The first one is called the primary amine, which has a formula like this. So only one hydrogen is replaced. The second category is called secondary amine, which means there are two hydrogens replaced. The third one obviously is called tertiary amine. So all of the three hydrogens are replaced. Also the R prime, means the R prime is not necessary to be the same as the R group. So I will give you about maybe one minute. Can you guys you know, draw all of the possible isomers based on the three categories here?
Jonathan, are you here? Would you like to turn your video on? Oh uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Carnegie. <clears throat> Uh, if you finish, you can quickly check with me. <clears throat> Let me know if you have any question. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you can keep working. If you finish, I will recommend you to try one more carbon to see whether you really fully understand this example. Oh, by the way, uh, how many of you uh, participated in the SOCC today and yesterday? Raise your hand. Let me have a quick look. One, two, three. Uh, not many of you, guys. Uh, once the, the mock test paper is released, uh, I will strongly recommend you guys to take some time to do that. Uh, in case you don't know, the SOCC is a mock USNCO national exam. There will be two parts part one and part two. Since many of you missed the part one, so you are not eligible to take the part two, uh, but you can still do it when after the test paper is released, right? So it's more like a practice rather than a, a ranking. <clears throat> okay, uh, for the first example, any question for me? There are four different isomers. Did you see my points, right? We start from the different skeleton and then I put the amine group on different carbons, right? For the secondary, it's a little bit harder because you try to insert an NH group in between two carbons, right? So if you follow the same idea for the more advanced example, guys, let's try it together. Uh, based on the DPE, based on the formula, the DPE is zero, right? It's not hard to figure out that. And then how many primary amines, guys? There are two different skeletons, right? For four carbons. How many? Luke, three. Now see, we can put the amine here, right? We can put the amine here, right? That's it, right? That's it, it's for this skeleton. How about the second skeleton? For it to be primary, you could just put it at the terminal. No, uh, you, you don't have to. We can put it here. Here is also primary. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Primary amine has a different definition with the primary alcohol. The primary alcohol, the primary means the carbon with the hydroxy group connected is primary. But here is the nitrogen is primary. The nitrogen has only one carbon connected. So this is the difference between primary amine and primary alcohol. So you just try to put the NH2 on different place. So we got four here. Does this make sense to you guys? Okay, I will leave the second category for you guys to work for maybe 45 seconds. As I want to check with you, if we say A, B, C, D is corresponding to one, two, three, four, 
but this is just for the secondary amines. So if you got your idea, let me know what do you think. How many secondary amines? You will probably realize the NH is a whole thing and need to be insert in between two carbons, right? This is how we got a secondary amine, right? So that means we can either insert here in the middle, right? We can also insert here in the middle, right? How about here? Do we need to care about this place? It's symmetric to the, the right one, right? So there are two for this skeleton. How many for the second skeleton? There's only one. You can either put it here or here or here, but they are all the same, right? I didn't, you know, draw all of the structure out. Can you, can you follow me? If you cannot, draw it by yourself, you know, just to show the structure. But the general strategy is supposed to be like this. So the correct answer is C. There are three secondary isomers. Yeah, half, half, right? For the tertiary one, there's only one, right? You cannot figure out more structures. So in total, four plus three plus one, there are eight isomers, eight, eight amine isomers. Okay, I think now you get a sense how to do the isomer counting. So before we summarize a systematic strategy, we want to briefly review what are the categories, what are different types of isomers. So the two big category is the left one, it's called the structural. Basically means they have different connection. They have different connections. They are all called structural. Sometimes it's also called, conf, what are the words they use? Constitutional. Constitutional, yes. These two are the same idea. Constitutional means structure. And the second big category is called stereoisomer. Stereo means, you know, they have the same connection, but they are arranged differently in the three dimensional world. So same connection, different arrangement. So let's go over each category one by one. So there are three subcategories in the structure isomers. The first one is called chain or skeleton isomers. Basically, they have different chain structures. For example, butane and isobutane, which is also called methylpropane. This is a systematic name. No problem, right? You, you see their chains are different. They have different skeletons. Can you give a good name to the second subcategory? Buta 2 in and buta 1 in? Position. Uh, this is called position or positional position because they have the same chain, but the function group are on different place, right? Different position. This is called the position. How about the last one? Functional. Two in and cyclobutane. They are both C4H8. What did you say, Luke? Functional. Functional, very good. They have different functional groups. The first one is an alkene with a CC double bond. The second one is a cycloalkane, right? The ring is a kind of the function group. So this is called function or functional. So basically all different, you know, isomers can be put in this three, you know, subcategory for structure isomers. But as you can see, they all have different connection, right? They have different connections. So this is why they are all called a structure. The second big category is called stereo. So we also have two subcategories. The first one, what is the name? Cis-trans. Cis-trans is a good name, but if we want to give a name to the, to the, to the isomerism, typically it's called geometric. Geometric, yes, Nathan, thank you. Geometric. Although, you know, you probably, I remember there was a year um, in the National Power One assessing the geometric, the name. So this basically cis-trans, 
but do not only focus on the double bond because the ring structures can also have cis and trans, right? For example, this is a cyclobutane. These two structures are different, right? The left one is cis. The right one is trans. Can the left one, you know, change into the right one without a chemical reaction? No, because the spinning, the rotation of this CC single bond is restricted by the ring structure. So this is quite similar to the pi bond, right? In the alkene, the pi bond is overlapping this way. So if you have to rotate it, you need to break the pi bond. That is a chemical process, right? So this is why there is this trans difference for the alkenes. Okay. The next category is called optical. optical. The reason they are called optical is because they have very similar physical and chemical properties except the optical property. One can rotate the single polarized light into one direction. Another one can rotate to the different direction. We do not need to, you know, get too much about the physics behind this. What you just need to understand is these two structures have different optical properties. One can rotate the single polarized light to one direction. Another one does a different way, right? So this one, there are several you know, concepts related to you know, this category. Uh, the first one is called chiral or chirality. That means like the hands. Chiral means hands, right? Left hand, the right hand. So the two hands are mirror image relationship. They are not superimposable, right? Guess I want to put those keywords. The first one is called chiral. This is just like the hands, your left hand and your right hands, right? The second concept is called the mirror images. So the two structure which can rotate the light differently are called mirror images. They are in a relationship of mirror images. That means one structure, if we put it in front of the mirror, you will see another different structure in the mirror. So there's another concept related to this, which is called enantium, right? The two structures who are mirror images are called enantium, right? No problem. Another concept which was not assessed before is called racemic mixture. That means a 50-50% mixture of two enantiomers or mirror images. So it's a mixture, it's not a pure compound. I have a question, guys. Is the recent mixture optically active or inactive? Inactive. Uh, can you say that again? Inactive. Inactive, why? Because there's cancellation between the direction of plane polarized light because both of that, there's 50-50% of each isomer. Makes sense, right, guys? Very good, thank you, Andrew. So recent mixture is optically inactive. Let me see, any other concept related to this? Uh, can you go over uh, meso compounds, do you think? Uh, we can do that, uh, but it was never you know, assessed before. Well, we can talk about that. Okay. Another concept is called diastereomer. Have you heard about this name? Can someone you know, briefly explain what is the definition of diastereomers? Is it like a one of the stereoisomers, but it's not an enantiomer? Uh, this is a good point, but this is not a definition. This is the one category of diastereomer. The definition of diastereomer is first, they are stereoisomers. But they are not enantiomers. They are not mirror images. So 
Look, you just mentioned about a one example of diastermos, which means if there are several chiral centers in the structure, for example, I will use a Fisher projection. Now say both of these two carbons are chiral. A, B, C, D, E, F. And I have another structure. This is A, B, C. That means the top carbon is the same, no change. But the bottom one is the opposite. I replace the position of D and E. So you will see these two structures are definitely stereoisomers, right? Because they are definitely not structure isomers. They are in the same category. They, are, they have the same connection, right? But they are definitely not enantiomers. You cannot say, oh, I have a mirror here and these two are mirror images. So these two are called diastereomers. Guys, how about cis and trans? Is cis and trans also diastereomers? By definition, yes. So this is something, you know, a lot of students are confused. So cis and trans, although they are called geometric, they are not even optical, right? But they are diastereomers. So the misconception is we only think they, these two are diastereomers, but we ignore the cis and the trans. I remember in one year of National Power One, this concept was assessed. It. Okay, I think now we got a good sense. Oh, uh, following uh, Andrew's question, another concept called miso, not miso soup, but very close. Okay. So the idea is there are multiple chiral centers in the structure, but the whole molecule is not chiral. You probably wonder, how can this be true? Multiple chiral centers, but the whole structure is a chiral. Uh, how can I give you an example? Wasn't there a question about this on the local test? This year? Yeah. Let me, let me have a look. I think near the end, one of the options might have been a meso compound. I can't remember. Yeah, I think I remember that. Uh... Okay. Actually, it wasn't. It wasn't. If I think if one of the one of the wedges on the top was a dash, would that be meso? Uh, we can have a look at this question first, right? This is a pretty interesting one. So which structure uh, depicts the enantiomer of the dial shown here? So what I did, let me you know, talk about my method. So for A, B, C, D, I all try to make it you know, similar or the same or the opposite with the structure you know, shown above. So this is why I did a flip to the structure in A. So after I flip it, I flip it in this way from the paper. I got the new structure I joined. And then why I want to do this? Because I want to make sure the pattern of these four are the same with the original structure, right? And now you see both of these two hydroxy groups are different. So I will say, this is the enantimo, right? This is the enantimo. And now you can have a look at B. B, I will say it is a style stereomer of the structure here. Because if you also flip it, uh, how to do the flip, flipping. Mm. How about we do it this way? We first flip in this way. I will get, you guys agree with me? If I flip it, I will got this, right? And now it's relatively close to the original structure, right? And then I will do a you know, uh, rotation here through the bump. I want to rotate the OH in the, in the top side. So that means I need to rotate by no matter what degree, the left one will be the same here. The right one, after the OH is rotated, it gets back, right? We got this structure, right? Does this make sense to you guys? You understand, you know, the, the wedge bound and the dash bound, the, the difference between these two bounds, right? Wedge means it's towards up, it's towards you, right? Dash means it's toward the yin, it's away from you. So this is the, the fundamental concept you may need to know. Okay, now you see the left structure is the same, right? The left structure is the same, but the right structure is the opposite. 
is a different. So this is a very good example of diastereomer, right? So B is not right. Uh, C, if you further analyze, actually it is uh, identical. Uh, what does it mean identical? Like the same compound? Or the same compound with the above structure, right? Yeah, if you, I think if you make the new, Newman projection back to the, the, the wedge dash, it's the same. Yeah. Mm, I think so. Right now, you understand, you know, the Newman projection, right? It's kind of connecting this way, connect there. So this one, this bond is not shown, it's projected, right? We are projecting through this bond. So this is why this bond is not shown, but you need to understand there is a bond there. I tried to show here. So now you see the both of the, these two OH groups are on the top, right? They're on the top. So this is why I think, you know, this is identical, it is the same. Okay, now I think we can talk about the meso. Guys, do you think this structure is chiral or achiral? Chiral. What did you say, Luke? I think it's chiral. It's chiral. Any different opinion? I was thinking maybe a chiral because there's a plane of symmetry. Uh, Wait, yeah, a, you're right. You're right. I think a plane of symmetry, right? I oh my god, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, if you if you rotate it, I think you can get the same thing. Yeah. So the easiest way for you to conclude anything is a chiral is to try to figure out whether there is a mirror plane in the structure or there is an involution center in the structure. So here we can clearly see there is a mirror plane in the structure. So which means the structure is a chiral. So if it is a chiral, that means it will be identical with its mirror image, right? So guys, let me ask you. What is the relationship between these two? Uh, don't answer. I want to give you an option, A, B, C, D. What is the relationship between the two green circle structure? A, identical. B, enantimo. C, diastereomer. D, anything you like, okay? But not D. Okay, most of you got it, right? They are identical, they are the same. You just flip it, right? This is relatively straightforward, right? And the reason why easily flipping can make these two identical is it's just because this structure is a chiral. There is a mirror plane in the structure. So I want to raise a similar question for you guys to think. So, How many, how many isomers does dichlorocyclobutane have? How many in total dichlorocyclobutane? This is a hard question, but after this question, I think you should have a great understanding about the concept we just discussed. Did you say how many isomers like total every single In total, kind? including all kinds of isomers? Can we have like a minute to draw this? The, the best way is to draw, draw all of them out. So guys, I want to remind you when I said dichloro, I didn't specify what are the relative positions of these two chlorine, right? So you need to put it into different categories.
uh, this is a pretty hard question. I didn't finish my drawing yet. I just want to show you, you know, the general idea. First, you need to consider the positional, right? The position. The two chlorine can be on the same carbon, can be on two neighboring carbons, can be on the one, three position, right? So this is why you have three big categories, category one, category two, and category three. Does this make sense to you? Oh, it's very easy to miss this one, guys. Very easy. Okay, now, am I done? Do we have more isomers? Is there any stereo isomers? I think you would have some enantiomers. Okay, let's label them one by one. Can you tell me which one has enantiomers? I think two is a meso compound, so none for two. Three has enantiomers. And I think five has enantiomers. I agree, I think three and five. Three and five. Any different opinions, guys? Do you agree with Luke and Andre? Two does not have any enantiomer because we can easily find a mirror plane, right? In the structure. So that means this structure is achiral. If it's achiral, it is superimposable with its mirror image. That means we have no enantiomer, right? Any different opinion, Alan? It's just three. Just the three. Why five does not have an enantiomer? Uh, it's not chiral, and you can cut like straight through the chlorines as a plane of symmetry, right? Ah, uh, you mentioned about this is a involution center. Yeah, yeah, like you cut. Oh, we can it. even think about this plane is a mirror plane, right? Cross this diagonal. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's not chiral because if you go the same way, it would be the same. Two You're of the right. bonds are identical. So there is a mirror plane and also an involution center. You guys understand what is the involution center, right? There is a dot here. If you connect this and extend to the opposite direction in the same distance, there is another atom, which is the same, right? And similarly here, if you do it in the same way, you will find the same. So only number three has an enantiomer. So in total, there are six isomers. Number four, a chiral, because similarly, you can also find a mirror plane, right? I think this is a great example. I hope, you know, through working on this example, you get a good understanding about all of the concepts, right? Okay, now I have a question for you guys, a further question for you guys to think. Let me make my handwriting a little bit clear. So can you tell me which one or which few are meso? Number two? Only number two? Be How about number four and number five? Yeah, we got some slight different idea. Number two, is this carbon chiral? Four different groups, right? One chlorine, one hydrogen, one carbon link like this, another different carbon link in this way, right? Chiral. This carbon, chiral. But the whole structure, a chiral. So this is perfectly middle, right? How about four and five, guys? Are these None two? None of those carbons are chiral. None of the carbons are chiral. Because if you go through this way and go through this way, these two chains are the same, right? So there is no chiral carbon. So we don't even need to talk about the concept of meso, right? So I like this example a lot because it can help us, you know, go over all of the concepts related, right? Enantimos, meso, right? Diastereomos, a structure isomers. Okay. Any question before I do a summary? Cool. So uh, we will take a few minutes to do a, eh? where am I? Sorry, we are here. We'll take a few minutes to do a summary and then we'll take a break. Yeah. So if you see a molecular formula, what is the systematic way? The first one is calculate DBE. I will take C4H10H8, for example, the DPE is one, know how to, to calculate. And then based on the DPE, you list all of the possible function groups. So it can be an alkene, it can be a cyclo alkane because the DPE is one, right? And there's no oxygen, so you don't have to think about any CO double bond, right? It's just a hydrocarbon. So two different you know, categories. How about if the DPE is two, what can you think about? 
for possible functional groups. You could have a ring and a double bond, or two ring rings. and a double bond. Very good. Two rings or two double bonds, or or a triple bond. Very good. So there are four, several different, you know, scenarios, right? Triple bond, two double bond, double plus a ring, two rings, right? Okay. So alkene and cycloalkane in each category, and then we think about the chain isomers, different chains. So four carbons, we can have two different chains. It can either be a straight chain. Straight chain doesn't mean it's linear, okay? Straight chain doesn't just mean there's no branches. And branch chain like this, right? Only two different skeletons or different chains. And then finally, you think about positional. You put the function group on different position, right? So here, you can put a double bond here or put a double bond here. I recommend you draw, draw both structure out because later you want to analyze any sterile isomers. If you do too fast here, you may skip some of the isomers. And then for the branch one, there's only one position you can add, right? And then finally, you think about the stereoisomers. Stereoisomers means either cis-trans or optical or chiral, right? Obviously, there's no chiral carbon here, right? So we can only think about cis-trans. Which one has cis-trans? The bottom one. This one, right? Yeah, you need to be a little bit experienced to you know, do it fast. If you're not so experienced, it is fine. Just need to pay a little bit of attention, right? Check one by one. So this is the trans one, this is the cis one, right? And then in the second category, cycloalkane. If we also want to analyze different chains, I would say there is a possibility of a three-membered ring, there is a possibility of four-membered ring, right? And for the three-membered ring, you need to add the massive group to a certain position. But all of three positions are the same. So this is only one product, right? And for the four-membered ring, that's just it. Stereoisomer, does any of these two isomers have stereoisomers in this carbon chiral? It's A chiral, right? If you go through this way, go through that way, they are symmetric. So it's A chiral, right? So that's it. So we got everything, right? Okay, guys, let's take a five minutes break. Uh, during the break, if you have time, you can think about if I add one more carbon, how many isomers does it have, okay? And then we'll have a quick check after the break. I will see you guys at 8.24 Eastern time.
Okay, I hope you found some time to think about this question. This is indeed a very challenging question. So just want to practice our strategy again. First, we calculate DBE, right? No problem, right? We got DBE to be two, and then we put in two different big categories, alkynes and cycle alkynes. For alkynes, we draw all of the chains, all of the possible skeletons, right? We got three different skeletons. You guys agree with me? Uh, Dr. Chen, I actually found a few more. You found a few more? Um, so in the first one with the linear one, mm. I think there's a cis trans with the yeah, second. I didn't I didn't consider the cis trans yet. You're right. Okay. It's cis trans. So I just didn't follow it step by step. We we analyze all of the three sorry, the three different uh, uh, skeletons. And then we try to consider the position, right? We add double bound to different places. So we got two here, three here, right? And no here, because if you add the double bond here, the central carbon has five bonds, right? So you break the uh, octet rule. So, and then we can further consider which one has cis and trans, right? First one, no cis and trans, right? Second one, yes, right? How about this one? No. How about this one? No, right? Because these two structures, these two groups are the same. So no cis and trans, right? Last one, no, no. So we are down in this side, right? Because we list all of the possible, you know, cases in a logical way. And then we start to analyze the possible cycloalkanes, right? So it can be three membrane, four membrane, and five membrane, right? So in the three membrane, we have two more carbons. So these two carbons can be an acyl group, right? They are connected together. It can be two methyl groups, right? And then the two methyl groups have no you know, choice. It can either be, it can only be close, right? One and the two. Oh, Wait, so Dr. Chen, no, what about- no, no, really, no, really. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say, sorry. Yeah, thank you, yeah. There is one more structure. The two methyl groups are on the same carbon, right? Uh, very easy to miss this one. And then when the two methyl groups are on different carbons, we can have this cis and trans, right? This is cis, this is trans, right? Is any of these two, Cairo? The, the right yeah. one. The second one is Cairo, right? But the left one is a Cairo because you can see a mirror plane here, right? But this one is indeed the chiral. So we can draw one more structure. And then cyclobutane, only one carbon left, that's it. Cyclopentane, that's it, right? So we show all of them. I don't think we missed any structures. So if you're confident, you know, solving isomer counting problem like this, I don't think you need to worry about, you know, the questions in the U.S. International. Question, Jonathan? Oh, no problem. Okay, great. Also, okay. Dr. Chen, yeah. isn't the DBE one? It's not, it's one, right? Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. It's not C5H. Oh yeah, the DBE is one, sorry, you're right. Yeah, the alkane cycle of uh, alkanes, no problem, right? Thank you. Okay, guys, let's continue. So I think we already finished the first part and the second part, chirality and optical isomer. So I will leave this for you to fill the blanks, okay? So the idea are uh, pretty much similar. Uh, we already you know, finished the discussion of the most complicated stuff. Uh, the second big topic here is introduction to organic reactions. Most of them are very fundamental. So we will not, you know, discuss them one by one. But there's one reaction, which is very important, commonly assessed in the US NCO, relatively hard to learn, is the esterification and the saponification. Uh, the reason this is complicated is because first, the mechanism is not easy. Secondly, it can be extended to biochemistry, right? Like the glyceride, right? Like the the trans fatty acid, which one is healthy, which one is not healthy, right? Uh, a lot of stuff behind this. Okay, guys, let's have a quick discussion. First, do you all know how to do nomenclature for esters? How about we have a practice? Uh, do we have a practice here? 
I do not hear. Uh, Michael, would you like to try name the first one? Um. So typically we start from the alcohol side, we will put the alcohol into a YL. So which side is the alcohol side? The left side or the right side? Is it the right side? The right side. So this one should be called this is methyl acyl propyl. Uh, ethyl. Ethyl, right? Ethyl benzoate? Benzoate, very good. Benzoate. Because the acid is called benzoic acid, right? Benzoic acid. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, but you, 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 you got a good name. Benzoyl 8. So we change the noic acid into the ATE, the 8, right? Okay, the second one, uh, Alvin. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm not totally sure. So what is the alcohol side? The alcohol side is the methanol, right? Yeah. So we call it methyl, it right? Good. What is the acid um, here? So is it butanoic? Uh, one, two, three, four. You are right. This is uh, butanoic acid, but we need to change the noic acid into ATE. So what would be the? Just butanoic. Butanoate. Very good. Thank you. Methyl butanoate, right? Uh, it's my spelling correct. I think it's with an A, the second. U-T-A, right? Yeah. U-T-A. Mm -hmm. The last one, we'll skip this because this is not a very typical, you know, uh, aster. But you understand, this is an aster, right? What this would be the name of that last one? I don't really know what you'd put for it. It's hard to do, give the name, but what we need to get is, you understand, this is an aster, right? It's a cyclic acid, aster, right? So if we open the aster, you break this bond, you will change this into how many? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Does this make sense to you? If you hydrolyze this cyclic ester, we will get a product like this. So in the structure, we have both the alcohol and the acid. So this is why it can do a intramolecular esterification reaction, right? Uh, I think in, there's a, a very unique name for asters like this. It's called lac lactur. Let me let me have a quick check. Yes, give me a second. It's called a lactone. I don't know why it's called lactone, but it's just called lactone. Okay, uh, this is the first part. Nomenclature. nature. Uh, I'm assuming you guys are all, are all good. Uh, if you have any question, please raise it or you know, do some you know, further reading by yourself. And then we are going to talk about the reaction, the basic model of the esterification. You know, this reaction is a dehydration process, right? The alcohol reacts with the acid by losing a water molecule. With this process, we call this process into a dehydration, right? Oh, this can be, sorry, there's a ladder missing. This can be interpreted as a substitution reaction, elimination, or addition. You guys can have a quick look about the reaction pattern in the left side. So the OH from the alcohol is gone. The H, oh, sorry, the OH from the acid is gone. The H from the alcohol is gone. They change into a water molecule. So if we want to put this into the three different categories of reaction types, substitution, Elimination or addition? Which one do you think? Elimination. Elimination. Elimination means, you know, we take away two groups and there is a double bound form, mm -hmm. typically. That is elimination, right? Yeah, that's why I was a bit confused. I mean, I would call it a condensation, but I mean, I'm not sure exactly what that would say. It is a condensation, you're right. But a condensation is not the fundamental, you know, categories for it, reaction types. But reaction types typically are called acid-based, redox, substitution, elimination, and addition, or polymerization. It, would it be substitution? Do you guys agree, Vikram? Yeah. 
okay. substitution. How to interpret is a substitution? This whole group is substituted by a new group, right? A RO, the OH is replaced by a RO. So this is a substitution. The full name of this mechanism is called nucleophilic addition and elimination because the first step is an addition. The second step is a elimination. So the natural result is a substitution. I uh, will talk about the mechanism a bit later. Okay, the reaction needs to be catalyzed, catalyzed by strong acid when you have H+. So why would you have H+, you can interpret this from different uh, reasons. The first one is a dehydration. We want to add the concentrated sulfuric acid to absorb the water molecules produced. And then we can shift this equilibrium to the right side. Well, this is the reverse of the reaction. So the concentrated sulfuric acid has a strong ability to, to dry the stuff, to get the water molecule out. Uh, did you watch the video? You know, when you add a concentrated sulfuric acid to sucrose, to table sugar, let me quickly show you. It seems like not many of you saw that before. The sucrose, which is a white crystal, is added in the beaker, and then some concentrated sulfuric acid added, and we swore it. So it quickly changed into black. Not black enough. And then it starts to expand. And then expanding. Let's skip some. Uh, those gas produced are toxic. So this experiment sh should be demoed in the hood. Okay, may I quickly check with you? What is the black stuff? Have a guess. Um, it's the solid carbon. Very good, very good guess, right? Solid carbon. Where is the carbon from? Definitely from the sucrose, right? But sucrose itself does not have carbon, right? It's a sugar, it's a polysaccharide, sorry, it's a disaccharide. This is called a dehydration process. You know, saccharides are carbohydrates. Carbohydrate means the formula can be written into carbon plus water. So that means in a lot of carbohydrate, in a lot of saccharide, the number of hydrogen and oxygen is in a two to one ratio, right? So the constant sulfuric acid is super strong. They take the hydrogen and oxygen out in a two to one ratio and change them into water and further absorb the water. So the sucrose change back into the carbon. My second question is, what, is the, what are the gases? SO3. SO3. SO3 is a, solid at room temperature. When it's heated, it can be changed into a liquid and a, a, a gas, that's possible. But what I want to remind you is concentrated sulfuric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. In the national part two, did you try write this reaction? Concentrated. I think it was assessed in one year of national part two reaction writing. So in this e equation, Copper is oxidized into copper sulfate because you know copper is a pre, sorry, a post hydrogen metal, right? So the reaction definitely is not between H plus with copper because H plus is not strong enough as we discussed yesterday, right? So what is reduced, guys? Sulfur. So what will be the products, Jonathan? It might be sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide is reasonable, right? SO2. So it changed from plus six to plus four. And then we have water produced. So now if we replace this copper into carbon, 
what would be the reaction? But definitely, we do not have copper sulfate anymore, right? What does carbon change into? Carbon need to go up, right? In terms of oxidation number. So what would be the stable form of carbon in the higher oxidation number? C4, C plus four plus? Plus four. So what would be the, the exact formula of the compound? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, very good, right? Carbon dioxide is reasonable, right? So the gas is a mixture of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Makes sense, right? I think this is kind of natural extension. So this is why you saw the black carbon is expanding because the reaction is exothermic. At the same time, it produces a lot of heat and also gases. Okay, uh, where are we from? Oh, we are from here. We are talking about why this reaction needs to be catalyzed by the concentrated sulfuric acid. Because if we have the concentrated sulfuric acid, it can absorb the water and then shift the equilibrium to the right side. But the side effect is we may also have, you know, the dehydration too much and make the solution black. That means some carbon is also produced. This is what we, what we want to avoid. So if we have any other battle choice, we can take away the water to shift the equilibrium to the right side, we will do that. Because concentrated sulfuric acid typically will give you a very messy mixture in the, in the, in the end. Okay, my next question is, how to experimentally confirm the way of the dehydration? Can we do a dehydration in this way? Well, I think we can just use some isotope of hydrogen. Oh, you mean we do isotope labeling? Yeah. This is commonly used in biology, right? We investigated the phage to, you know, to, I think it's phage with the bacteria, right? Or no, with the virus, right? So we use the isotope labeling like phosphor 31 to investigate how the nucleic acid is transferred, like nitrogen 15, to investigate how the peptides and the proteins are produced, right? So here is the same. So we can do it this way. We can label the, this auction with auction 18, right? And then if the dehydration process is like what we shown here, what is the oxygen 18 in the products? Is it in the water is it in the ester? In the water? In the ester. It's in the ester, right? Because the alcohol actually loses the hydrogen, not the OH. Oh, so right. it, will be, it will be here. So my next question is, how do we know which compound carry the isotope labeling? I think it would be a little bit heavy, right? Uh, heavy, you mean imagine the mass. Yeah. That might be possible. But you know, if you just use a balance to measure the mass, that's pretty much impossible, not practical. Do we have any equipment, instrument, which can measure the mass? Mass spectrometer? Exactly, right? We'll see a different peak, right? With plus two in molar mass in M over Z, right? Guys, oxygen 18 is not you know, radioactive. So we cannot expect, you know, the one of the products is radioactive, okay. Okay, cool. The next is about the mechanism. The mechanism is an acid catalyzed reaction. Uh, it's pretty complicated, actually. Uh, I do not want to spend too much time to talk about this here, but it was assessed in the USNCO before. So it asks you, what is the exact function of the H plus in the system? I'm not sure whether I can find the question or not. Let me have a try. Acid, asterification, USNCO. Well, I found many stuff made by me. 
<laughs> you are saying so coaching sessions like this one. Oh, this is not by me. Uh, so May uh, 2016. This is in a part one. I'm not sure. Is it in 2016? Seems like not. Yes, I will try to find it later. And I think it's in 2017. 2017 national power one or local? Uh, national power one. I do not have an impression it's in 2017. But let's have a look. 2017. Oh, you are right. Okay. What is the role of the acid catalyst in the Fischer esterification reaction below? Let's read it one by one. Option A, shift the equilibrium in the right-hand direction. Sound correct. Option B, neutralize the base formed as a side product in the reaction. There is no base form, right? Option C, convert ethanol to a more reactive nucleophile. Option D, convert propan propanoic acid to a more reactive electrophile. D actually is the correct answer. A is not. But I don't don't be confused, guys. I mentioned about concentrated sulfuric acid can shift the equilibrium to the right side because it can absorb the water. But not all of the acid. If you have just a regular acid, the acid itself cannot shift the equilibrium, right? But shifting the equilibrium to the right side, we need to take away one product. So this is how the concentrated sulfuric acid is working. It absorbs the water and decreases the concentration of water, right? And then shift it to the right side. Or you can say, make the solution more concentrated and then the equilibrium shift it to the right side, right? So don't be confused by the option A. So now let's try to understand why A, why D is correct. The first step, as you can see, the H plus bind with the CO double bond oxygen. And then we got a, Pro protonated product like this. And then the alcohol use the oxygen lone pair to attack the positive carbon here. Guys, can we figure out which is the nucleophile, which is the electrophile? This is not hard, right? Nucleophile is a Lewis base. Electrophile is a Lewis acid, right? So this is the nucleophile. This is the electrophile. So now can you understand why option D is right? What does this mean? That's so why after the protonation, this one is more reactive, is a more reactive electrophile. How to interpret this? Maybe like one of the bonds from the C to O double bond could mm -hmm. form a lone pair on the oxygen leaving a carbocation. That would be extremely electrophilic. Very good point. So we have another rosin structure like this, right? So now you can clearly see, this is a much stronger or more positive carbon. It's easier to be attacked by a nucleophile, right? Option C, making the alcohol a stronger nucleophile is totally wrong. Because if we protonate the ROH, We got this, the oxygen atom carry the positive charge. It is not a nucleophile anymore. It's not a good nucleophile anymore, right? So the protonation cannot change the alcohol into a, a bad nucleophile. And then the next step is pretty complicated. There are several steps of, you know, um, proton transfer. But what I want to remind you is this step, this step, we convert the sp2 hybridized carbon into a sp3 hybridized carbon. Does this make sense to you? So a trichinoplanar structure changes into a tetrahedral structure. So this process actually is an addition. Is an addition. And then we have a proton transfer. We transfer the proton from here, from this place to this place. You see that, right? We have a proton transfer. And then we use the lone pair from the OH, kick back, kick off 
the water. Because the water is a much better living group compared to the hydroxide. Hydroxide is a bad living group. So we kind of recover this CO double bond. So the carbon, the central carbon is back to SP2 again. And then finally, we deprotonate the hydrogen. So you will see the H plus is regenerated. So this is why H plus is a catalyst, it speed up the reaction. Catalyst is involved in the reaction, which can speed up the reaction, right? So what is the type of this reaction? Is this a substitution? Addition or elimination? Substitution. Yeah, I, I think overall, overall is the substitution. Oh, overall, sorry. I thought you were asking overall. No, no, I'm not asking overall. I'm talking about this step only. This oh. step, the lone pair is back and kick off a living group, forming a double bond. This is the character elimination. for, for elimination. elimination. This is the elimination. But obviously, this elimination, elimination is slightly different from the aminations you learned, like, you know, the alkyl halides lose a HX, right? Or an alcohol lose a water. So it's slightly different. But the recovering of a double bond is indeed an elimination reaction. So this reaction is called nucleophilic addition and elimination. So the natural result is a substitution. So this is a substitution, right? Yes, I probably will use another 10 minutes uh, to finish the second part, the ester hydrolysis. You know, when the acid catalyzes the esterification process, this reaction is still reversible, right? That means under the same condition, we can also hydrolyze the ester. So if we add water catalyzed by acid, we can convert the ester back to the acid and the alcohol. Makes sense, right? So how can I shift the equilibrium to the right side, guys? If I want to shift the reaction to the right side, I want to hydrolyze the products, the esters. I just add a lot of water, right? But the water can dilute all of the stuff, but the right side is diluted more than the left side as we discussed in our first session, right? So although water has no concentration in the equilibrium constant, but it can shift the equilibrium to the right side. So I have a slightly extended question for you to think about. If we do not add water, we add another alcohol in the system, what would be the products? Would you have another ester and an alcohol? Hmm. So that means the only difference is this hydrogen will be replaced by the R prime, right? Because the difference between R prime OH with water is one H in the water is replaced by the R prime. So we will get a new ester. Does this make sense? This reaction is called trans esterification because we convert one ester into a different ester. Obviously, this reaction is reversible, right? So which ester is the major product is determined by which alcohol is added in excess. If this alcohol is added in excess, the equilibrium will shift it to the left side. Make sense, right? Okay, there we go. So this is not our key point. Our key point is the basic hydrolysis. This reaction is also called saponification. I will talk about what is the mechanism and why the reaction is called saponification. So if excess strong base is used to hydrolyze the ester, the original alcohol and the salt containing the something of the carboxylic acids are formed. Let's have a look at the reaction here. We got the alcohol, right? We also got this. So we should put the salt containing the conjugate base of the original acid, acid right, is formed. The mechanism is relatively easy to understand. We have hydroxide as the nucleophile. We attack this positive carbon, and then we open this CO pi bond. 
we got a tetrahedral intermediate O minus. But you know, you see this sp3 carbon is more crowded. But previously, there are only three stuff connected to the central carbon, a trigonal planet. The bound angle is 120. But now it's a tetrahedral. The bound angle is getting smaller, 109.5. So it's getting more crowded. And then the O minus want to recover the CO double bond. So it will attack back, try to recover the double bond. When the double bond is recovered, we need to push a group to leave, right? So the R O, the R2 O minus is off, is off. But you know, when it is off, it turned into this. This is a super strong base, right? So we we'll try to gain a proton from the water. And finally, it will be in this way. So this is the mechanism. But I want you guys to think about from a different perspective. If you have an alcohol ester like this, if we add hydrolyze this ester in basic condition, first we break this bond, right? What do we add to the left side, guys? After we break it, what do we add to the left side? OH. OH. What do you add in, in the right side? H. H. So this is why it's called hydrolysis, right? Hydrolysis means you break the water molecules into H and OH. You add the OH to the positive side and add the H to the negative side, right? So this is exactly the idea, but it's not done yet. Because after this part is turned into the acid, now it's in the basic condition. So this one will be deprotonated. Finally, turned into the conjugate base. The alcohol will still be the alcohol. So the final products will be these two. So now, can you understand why this basic hydrolysis, which is also called saponification, is irreversible? Why it cannot be back anymore? Is it with Le Chatelier's principle and having a stronger acid and base on the left side versus on the right side? Mm, what is the stronger acid in the left side? Well, the stronger base is the hydroxide compared to the um, the acid, the, the conjugate base. The of conjugate that. base. Uh, this can be a reason, but this is not the best way to interpret this. The key point is the acid now is changed into the conjugate base. This is a super bad electrophile because you can draw a resonance, which is equivalence, right? You can draw a resonance. By showing this resonance, that means this carbon is not that positive anymore. This carbon kind of gains a lot of electrons from the negative oxygen, right? So it loses the ability to have the nucleophilic, you know, substitution reaction. So it's not reversible anymore. So this is the key point of the saponification. It's not reversible anymore. And now we want to extend this reaction a bit. Try to understand why this reaction is called saponification. Because in the past, this is the way how we make soaps. What is the soap about? We start from this one. Did you see? This is actually an ester. How many ester groups are in the molecule? You can see clearly there are three ester groups, right? So what is the name in biology of this compound? Triglyceride. This is called triglyceride, right? Why, how to interpret the, the try here? What does the try here mean? Three, three acid is used and one alcohol is used. Okay, but this alcohol is a trial. There are three OH groups on this alcohol. So this is why one molecule of alcohol need to react with three molecules of monoprotic acid 
So this is why it got the name triglyceride, right? So what is the name of this alcohol, guys? Glycerol. It's called glycerol, right? It's called glycerol. Uh, this is commonly added to the makeup because it can attract water molecules and prevent the makeup to dry. Now this makes sense too. The tri the glycerol can attract water molecules. If you are required to explain why glycerol, you know, can attract water molecules. Because the the right side is polar and it can make hydrogen bonds. A lot of OH group, right? Making a lot of hydrogen bonds with water molecules, right? And this is similar to what the baby used, the dipoles. You guys know the dipoles can you know hold the water molecules, right? This is why you know we use it for dipoles, right? So what is the structure of the polymers added in the dipole? There are a few different generations. The current one is like this. It's a polymer, a super long chain, but on the polymer, there is a COO minus structure. So this one, obviously, it can make a lot of hydrogen bond with water molecules, right? Because on the polymer chain, there are thousands of COO minus, right? So this is what it can hold the water molecules. Okay, back to the question. This triglyceride actually is the component of oil and fats. So what we need to put it here is triglyceride. But you probably wonder why this one has a suffix of IDE, different from the regular asters with the ATE, right? Don't ask me, this is English, not my native language. So it's just the IDE here. So it's confusing, right? You know, theoretically, it should be ATE because it's an aster. If we follow the nomenclature of the other, you know, uh, asters, it should be something like triglyceride or rate, not sure, but it's called triglyceride. And it is an aster of the glycerol. The glycerol is here. So it's a tri-alcohol, right? And a long chain carboxylic acids, which are called fatty acids, fatty acid. So those are oil and fats. If we add the base and we heat the fats and the oil, and then the esters will be hydrolyzed. What are our products? We got the original alcohol, which is the glycerol, and we got the three conjugate base of the carboxylic acids, right? This is soap, which is the mixture of long chain carboxylic acid salts. Can you understand? Why this stuff can be used as soap? Is it because one side of it is hydrophilic and the other side is hydrophobic? So You're right. the hydrophilic end will dissolve in water, but the hydrophobic end can surround anything like oil that's nonpolar. So it makes a shell around it so it dissolves in water. Very good point. Hydrophobic. You understand this side is hydrophilic, right? The CO minus, this side is hydrophobic, right? Uh, four is not this four, it's pH, okay? So now say, now say this is your, not your pants, this is your t-shirt, okay? Uh, now say this is the t-shirt. And then there is the oil residue here, and then, The hydrophobic side will attach with the oil, but the hydrophilic side will bind with the water molecules and finally make this residue smaller and then wash it away, right? There's a name for a structure like this. They are called amphiphile. That means they can, one side is hydrophilic, another side is hydrophobic, right? Can you recall the cell membrane, guys? The membrane has a bilayer structure, right? What is the component? It's called lipid. Phospholipid. Phospholipid, right? 
So the structure is quite similar. One side is hydrophilic, another side is hydrophobic, right? So why they want to form the bilayer, guys? Because the outside um, is the hydro, is the, okay, so it's the, I just had a bio test on this. I shouldn't be forgetting. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure the inside is nonpolar and the outside is polar. So it can react with, it can form a, a kind of a, a membrane kind of barrier as well as being able to be philic with the out the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. Yeah. Oh my gosh, biology so good. <laughs> this actually is really biology, right? Biochemistry. So you know, cell is an ecosystem, and outside of cell is also an ecosystem, right? So now the hydrophilic side will toward out and leave the hydrophobic side in the in the middle. So this is why there is a bilayer, right? I think this is not hard to understand. Now I say, uh, when I you know, was in the United States for the first time, I did not speak English. So obviously I will try to find someone who speaks the same language with me. This is exactly this part. So there will be a small group you know, of students who share the same language, right? Because the, the environment is all English speakers. Okay, cool. Uh, so we are very close to the end. We understand how does the soap work? Um, oh, we are done with this part. Because this is the most important, you know, reaction, organic reaction you should know. Uh, I have a, a few contents what I want to go over in the beginning of the next class. But since, you know, our next class is on Wednesday, right? So I hope you guys can take some time to go over, not just go over this time. You need to, you know, work on this packet and try to finish that and, you know, label the questions we have. Uh, we do not have much time, you know, to discuss them one by one because most of those reactions in the packet are very fundamental. I think most of them are in the local level even. But, you know, considering organic can is still a challenging part. So it will take some time to, to continue this packet, but probably not much time. Uh, I will show you a new packet tomorrow that will be the second organic packet for our, you know, uh, next class on, I believe on Saturday or on Sunday, right? So because, you know, I purposely put the organic in a different weekend, right? So you guys can take some time to go over the packet. So based on our plan, what is our next part about? Let me see. Next will be advanced kinetics. We'll talk about this in, on Wednesday. So on Saturday, on, eh? Eh? Wait a second. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. We don't have class on Wednesday. I ha we, we schedule a class on the last Wednesday, right? So I will see you next Saturday, the coming Saturday. So which means you guys have a bit of time, a little bit more time to go over the packet we discussed, we finished, right? Or we partially finished. And at the same time, I will also send you the sign up link for you guys to, to pick up a time for us to have some you know, more detailed, specific discussion. Uh, please expect that, expect that. Okay, uh, before we end the class today, do you have any last minute question? I have one question. Mm -hmm. So when, we were, when I was going through the packet, I got to the part with Toland's test and mm -hmm. I just wanted to know the answer to the question of which of the following would give the negative Tolan's test. Oh, this one? Mm -hmm. So it will be, it will be acetone. So how come formic acid would be positive? A uh, formic acid, if you draw the structure, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. So did you see the formaldehyde, the aldehyde group here? Oh, right. So similarly, the four mates, right, also have the, the aldehyde group. Wait, can you draw the ethyl formate, please? Yeah, it's similar, right? Because I think this is a good practice for you <laughs> to test Wait. your number of nature. Acyl formate. Oh, it's the formate. Okay, sorry. I was just, the reason I was a bit confused about that is because I was treating it just like as like a general carboxylic acid or... Um, in that case, an ester. I didn't realize that there was just H on one side because it was formate. Yeah. 
So formate is the uh, kind of a common used name for methanol eight. Mm -hmm. Methanol eight. Okay, uh, I think look, you set a good example for us. Guys, take some time to work on the the packet, and I will try to show you the uh, annotation for all of the packets we assign in Google Classroom before next Saturday. Hopefully, you guys can find some time to check them one by one, and then we'll have another discussion on Saturday. Um, I just have one question. Is there a kinetics packet for next session or no? Uh, I do not plan a packet, uh, but if you want to have one, I, you know, I have thousands of packets I can share with you, but I do not have time to go over the packet. Okay. Yeah, we, no. will, we will focus on some practice problems from okay. the national exam directly, because that part is calculation-based. So the first step is understand the principle, but the more important, important part is get the method, do the practice, right? So it's a different story compared to descriptive and organic. So for different topic, we'll have different strategy. But after our discussion, if I feel, you know, you might need to work on a packet to learn it more systematically, uh, I, I, I will, you know, put that in Google Classroom if you need. Okay, great guys. Uh, Thanks for your participation. Uh, we'll see you next Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Bye.